Good morning. My name is William Malik. Thank you very much for attending this presentation and for participating in this event. My talk today is going to be on building the cyber resilient smart city. In the course of this material, we're going to go through a definition of what makes a city smart. Then we are going to take a look at the architectures behind smart cities. And we're going to conclude with a discussion of the vulnerabilities and how to remediate them. So what makes a city smart? In 2014, the government of Scotland did a study on smart cities and they came up with the following definition. That a city is smart if it uses data and digital technologies to provide a sustainable environment that promotes citizens' well being and economic development. This is a very useful working definition, and that's the one that we'll follow for the course of this talk. There are many architectures to support smart cities. This one, taken from the ET City Brain program from alibabacloud.com shows the sensors and historical data at the base, a layer of integrative technology above that, and then with increasing sophistication management tools, some of which are operated by people and some of which increasingly will be in fact uh, run by uh, artificial intelligence and machine learning programs. Uh, this increases the efficiency of the smart city. But note that nothing is happening here that is going to particularly uh, change the goals of the smart city. Without the intelligence, the city would still have the same purpose. It's just it wouldn't be able to do it as efficiently, perhaps. So what kinds of vulnerabilities do we see in the smart city? Well, here's a list. The most important ones are those that involve the interfaces across components. Within each domain, the manufacturers have the ability to improve the integrity and security of their platform. It's when you cross boundaries, when you go from one technology to another, from one vendor to another, those are the areas that are most likely to have information security problems. On the bottom right, we see um, the smart grid. Smart grid vulnerabilities include such things as the communications between the grid and the smart meters in home and business properties. Smart meters are designed to be <clears throat> efficient, uh, low cost, low power, and very uh, inexpensive. This means that there are going to be a lot of them and they're not going to be particularly secure. So one concern we have is that research has shown people can take over smart meters and forge messages indicating, for instance, a significant increase in load. This would cause the smart grid to then call for additional power. The problem is that there's no actual consumption for that power which means now you have all of this energy flowing into the city and no place for it to go. So dealing with that load is a technical problem. In addition, there are the financial implications. Calling for that additional load will incur premium pricing. So now you have a vulnerability to the economic integrity of the uh, region relying on that particular smart grid. Smart buildings as well have vulnerabilities that lie at the interfaces. A typical smart building will have componentry to ensure the safety and integrity of its internal systems uh, and the safety and comfort of its occupants. So for instance, if an escalator fails, the smart building system will say, ah, oh, this escalator has stopped working. But understand that the escalator itself is engineered well. It will come to a stop smoothly. And when it stops working, it'll be locked in place. What that means is the people who are on the escalator are not likely to be thrown about. And it also means that the escalator can still be used as a stair. So it's a medium severity problem. You've got to get somebody there to fix it, of course, but nobody's going to be in peril because the escalator is not working. Similarly, if an elevator fails, that would be a high severity incident, but not because the elevator is going to fall. The technology for elevators has been around a long time. They don't drop, but locked in place, it means that the people who are transporting in it will not be able to get out. So you want to get a crew there quickly to open the doors, help them get out of the place, and then restore the operation of the elevator. 
the smart building system may notice uh, glass breaking. It may hear the particular sound pattern of uh, crockery or uh, glassware uh, shattering and would say that's a low severity incident. We've got to transfer the information to a custodian, a janitor. They'll come by with a bucket and a mop and pick up whatever liquid spilled and sweep up any fragments. Unless, unless that sound is correlated with a public safety system that reports an active shooter incident, in which case the broken glass may in fact be a bullet coming through a window. And now you have to evacuate part of the building. Where does information security come in? Well, if that message can be forged, you can create a panic and disrupt the activity inside the building simply by transmitting a message. In other words, the connection between the smart building software and the public safety software has to allow for mutual authentication. It has to allow for message verification, it has to allow for data integrity, all of which are information security concepts, which have to be implemented consistently across all the vendors of public safety systems, the transport mechanisms, and the vendors of smart building systems. So cybersecurity becomes a potential critical vulnerability in that area. Similarly, smart cars rely on communications both between vehicles and from the vehicle to the infrastructure. This linkage itself is getting better. The vehicle vendors are improving their technology, but we're not there yet. And my firm's published research on vulnerabilities in all of these areas. We're going to drill down now into two particular areas of vulnerability. The first is 5G, where we're going to take a look at the pace of the rollout. And the second is Internet of Things. And we'll conclude with a review of what vendors and smart city uh, administrators uh, can do to minimize those. So 5G actually is not one thing. The initial release of content for 5G was RHEL 14, release 14 of the third generation partnership program. Uh, 3GPP is the consortium of regional standards bodies for cell phones. And they put out releases at regular intervals. Some are small, some are large. Right now, we are about a third of the way through release 17. The manager of release 17 has said that he wants this one to be relatively small, meaning he expects maybe a dozen or so uh, standards initiatives to be included in it. If you're a handset manufacturer, and you're relying on release 17 to help you determine the content of your 5G offering, you won't be able to start work until next year. You can't build a standards compliant device until the standards are set. Release 18, which will follow that, contains the rest of what goes into 5G. So let's take a look at what's involved. Here are the candidates for release 17. The manager has said only a dozen of these are going to make it. If you take a look at this list, a lot of things have to do with the new radio. That's the higher frequency technology. That's gonna give us the incredible high transmission speeds and densities and very high quality that are components to 5G, especially in industrial applications. But note that only a dozen of these are gonna make it. The vendors proposing these standards will then have to go back and resubmit them for release 18, which will be a big release, a release taking about two years to complete, and it won't kick off until 2021, which means that we're not gonna see the final release of 5G as the plan is currently structured until the end of 2023, which means handset manufacturers are not gonna be able to start building until early 2024. This chart of vulnerabilities is quite comprehensive. I just want to highlight two things. On the left, with the extremely high density of devices, one consequence is we're going to have to have a lot more towers. In the Black Hat conference a couple of years ago, some hackers showed that creating a spurious 4G cell tower took about $1,000 worth of equipment would fit in the back of a van. The towers for 5G are going to be so common. They're going to need to be so densely packed. You need a tower about every hundred meters in order to sustain the level of traffic and the density of devices. 
which means that a typical 5G tower is going to retail for about 200 euros, about $250, which means that hackers aren't going to have to build them. They'll just be able to buy them cheaply and stand up uh, their own Pico cell. On the right, you see the stacks of virtualization that are needed in order to provide the full 5G content. Each application runs with its own stack of virtual machines. And as the owner of the handset or as the device traverses from cell to cell, that stack has to be torn down and rebuilt. Because of the density, we're talking a million devices per square kilometer, basically a device every square meter across the city on average. That's a huge amount of virtualization that's going to be stood up and torn down rather rapidly. And that level of complexity has never been experienced before. So on the left, we have the extremely inexpensive, affordable towers. And on the right, we have a hugely complex and fast moving uh, technology stack to support it. Next, we'll take a look at the Internet of Things operating system. Uh, this is a, from an advisory that was put out earlier this year concerning the Urgent 11. Uh, this is a group of uh, 11 vulnerabilities uh, impacting the uh, TCP IP stack, the communication stack incorporated in the VxWorks operating system. Now, VxWorks has been around for a long, long time. And this technology uh, has been incorporated in thousands of devices. The vendors listed here have all reported that they themselves include this technology and these vulnerabilities. And if you have an electronic copy of this presentation, you'll see that the underlined ones are in fact URLs that will get you to the website describing the kinds of specific vulnerabilities and remediation that are necessary. These systems have been in place for over 13 years. IoT devices live a long, long time. These vulnerabilities have been around over a decade. We see active exploits now, and it is important to get these things fixed. But this talks about the dependencies. Each of these vendors is not going to build their own TCP IP stack. Instead, they're going to rely on infrastructure, and a vulnerability in infrastructure will impact all of the devices. On the next chart, we see one of the consequences of these infrastructural dependencies. In April of last year, older GPS satellites reported an incorrect date. Uh, this is because they had a 10-bit counter, and the counter counts weeks, which means after 1,023 weeks, the counter rolls over. Well, the counter started in January of 1980. This was an architectural decision that was made over 30 years ago. And last April, it caused, among other things, Boeing 787s to report an incorrect date. Because the date was incorrect, the plane could not be certified as airworthy, and many were grounded on that day. Similarly, in New York City, the wireless internet that the city provided itself collapsed also in April of last year uh, because the city internet service depended upon time signals which were tied to these older satellites. Now, the satellites can't be repaired in place. What they did was simply roll the counter forward, which means this problem will recur in 2038. In Toronto, Google's Sidewalk Labs program was canceled uh, because although the 100 plus acre development in the K side of uh, Toronto uh, was quite appealing, the amount of information that was gathered created public mistrust and therefore the town decided to put a halt to this particular smart city initiative because of privacy concerns. So what can we do? Well, this is a program that the state of Rhode Island is standing up to provide trustworthiness and strengthen civic participation. A citizen in Rhode Island can call 311 if they believe their computer is under cyber attack. They don't have to be a business, they can be an individual. Anyone in the state can call this in. The call goes to a call center staffed by students who then provide answers, giving the consumer, the business, a level of security, giving the students practice and giving the state awareness of the existence of such an attack. This kind of activity can build support 
can build awareness and increase transparency. So here's some recommendations. First, city administrators need to make sure that whatever they do can be clearly understood. They have to respect privacy and provide for transparency. Vendors need to make sure their technology supports message authentication, encryption, and integrity. Here we have a list of references. Those of you who need a copy of the presentation can reach out to a conference organizers or myself at Trend Micro. Thank you very much for your time and attention.